When I was a boy, my father worked as a ticket collector at a merry-go-round in Revere Beach, at that time the Coney Island of Massachusetts. Kids loved to ride on flying horses that circled around and around. My dad told me of discussions he had with parents putting tiny tots on flying horses that seemed too fast for safety. If the ride seemed too fast, my dad suggested placing the child on horses nearer the center away from the outer edge. He explained that horses near the outer edge moved faster. But many patrons insisted all horses moved around and around at the same speed. Ah, what was going on here? It seems there was confusion about two kinds of speed. One is the rotational speed of the merry-go-round, which except for starting up and slowing down, was constant. Its rotations per minute its RPMs were constant. Just like a record player that rotated at a constant speed of 33 and a third revolutions per minute, a rotating disc that played music before the advent of CDs and the like. Anywhere on the record, the RPM rate was the same 33 and a third revolutions per minute. Such records are, by the way, still used by disc jockeys for mixing sounds, so they're not quite relegated to museums. Whether records or merry-go-rounds, RPMs on the inner part are the same as RPMs on the outer edge. Same everywhere. What's the other kind of speed? Linear speed, what we've been discussing in previous lessons. That's the miles per hour, feet per second, meters per second that describe how fast you're moving. Place a penny on a rotating disc and maybe it will stay and maybe it will fly off depends on the RPMs. But more important, how far the penny is from the center. The farther from the center, the faster its linear speed. See this? A penny circling near the outer edge moves a greater distance in the same time than a penny near the center when making a circle. It's easy to see the linear speed of the penny is greater near the outer edge. In fact, a penny near the outside might fly off the record while a penny near the inside won't. This is what my dad was trying to convey at the merry-go-round. That a child riding horses near the outer edge moved faster than horses closer to the center. In physics, we describe this as V is proportional to R omega. Speed V is directly proportional to the radial distance R from the center multiplied by the RPMs. We show rotational speed, say in RPMs, with the Greek symbol omega. Back to the merry-go-round. With a constant omega, linear speed V increases as radial distance from the center R increases. Look at this. My dad was right. Horses farther away from the axis of the merry-go-round with greater radii move faster. Greater radius R, greater linear speed V with RPMs omega the same. Talking about merry-go-rounds, rotational motion, and record players reminds me of discussions in the old days in Miami, Florida with sign painter friend Burl Gray. One of the many puzzles he posed to me while painting billboards had to do with record players. Not the music they produced, but the mechanics of a rotating turntable. Burl was interested in what would happen if a small object such as a marble were placed on a record while rotating. He knew it would soon leave the edge, but he wondered about the path it would follow. Would the path curve? Would it be a straight line? And in what direction would the path take? To make the puzzle more interesting, Burl suggested the record have a heavy bar resting on it so that the marble or sliding object would be guided along a straight line before flying off the edge of the record. 
We enjoyed puzzles such as this while we painted daily. I ate it up while other painting partners of Burl's had no use for such discussions. Burl and I became good friends and our friendship continues to this day. Well, Burl's puzzle called for an experiment. I decided I'd impress my new friends and do the experiment. For I had a small record player at Miami apartment, which I'd place on the floor. Then I'd place a cooking utensil on it to act as the bar that Burl suggested. Then I'd watch to see the path of a marble as it rolled from the center off the edge. Furthermore, I'd do something really nifty. I'd sprinkle a bit of talcum powder on the floor so the path of the marble across the floor would clearly show. That was my plan. I was newly married at the time, and you know what? My wife and I went out to the movies that evening, and the following evening other things came along, and guess what? I forgot to carry out my experiment. Some years passed before I actually did the experiment. Do you know what they say about good intentions? So I leave the problem to you. Here we see four possible paths. A, B, C, and D. What's your take on this? When the marble rolls off the edge, will it follow path A, directly outward from the rotating record? Will it follow a curve, something like that of path B? Will it follow a straight line, as in C? Or will it follow a tangent, as in D? What's your choice? The answer to this question remained a secret from me for several years. Do you want me to tell you the answer? And can you keep a secret? Well, I can too. So maybe check with your friends. And what if your friends don't have an answer? then maybe it's time to get some new friends. And if that doesn't work, maybe it's time to find a record player and a bit of talcum powder and experiment. Until next time, good energy. Nellie Newton whirls an empty tin can attached to the end of a string in a horizontal circular path. The pull she exerts on the string keeps the can circling. Any force directed to a fixed center is called a centripetal force. Centripetal means center seeking or toward the center. Earth's gravitational pull on the moon is a centripetal force, as is the electric force that pulls electrons in circular paths about atomic nuclei. Centripetal force takes many forms. Centripetal force on Nellie's whirling can depends upon the mass of the can M, the can speed, and the radius of curvature R, which in this case is the length of the string. In lab, you'll likely use the exact relationship. F equals mv squared over r, where force is measured in newtons, mass in kilograms, speed in meters per second, and radial distance in meters. Note that speed is squared, so twice the speed needs four times the force. This equation is simply the familiar form of Newton's second law when expressed as F equals ma where here centripetal acceleration is v squared over r and to keep this lesson brief I won't go into how acceleration a becomes v squared over r for circular motion perhaps for further study we already know objects in circular motion accelerate because the velocity changes in direction so now we see that the force producing circular motion is f equals m v squared over r to a close approximation, we can say the centripetal force on Nellie's can is tension T in the string. It would be exactly T if the string maintained a horizontal position throughout the swing. More about this in a bit. Here's a top view of the whirling can. Do you see the force in the can directed inward or outward? I hope at this point you don't think as many people think that it's outward. <clears throat> centripetal force acts inward toward the center of circular motion. Suppose the string breaks. 
in what direction will a can travel? Will it travel outward like this? No way! <laughs> with no force holding it in a circle, in accord with Newton's first law, it will move in a straight line. A straight line that is tangent to its path at the moment the string breaks. In fact, we say the velocity of the can moving in a circle is tangential velocity, velocity that is tangential to the path. Consider an automobile driving on a muddy road. If adhesion of mud on each of its spinning tires is not great enough to hold mud on the tires, that is, if centripetal force is insufficient, mud flies off. In what direction? I hope you didn't say radially outward, as many people think. The mud flies off in straight line tangents to the tire surface. The green arrows show the tangential directions. Here's a top view of a car rounding a curve. The path is part of a circle, so there's got to be a centripetal force on the car. What kind of force comprises the centripetal force? Can you see its friction between the road and the tires? I hope you agree. We ask how much friction? We then apply the equation for centripetal force. Here italic F stands for friction, M is the mass of the car, V is its speed, and R is the radial distance, the distance to the center of curvature of the road. If friction is too weak, then the car will skid from the curve. Here's an interesting question. Can a car be driven along a curved road if there is no friction between its tires and the road surface? The answer is a delightful yes, if the road is properly banked. Let's look at the principal forces acting on the car when there is no friction. That's its weight, mg, and the normal force, n. Recall that the normal force is always at right angles to the supporting surface. We indicate the radial distance with a green line. Now here's the interesting part. There isn't a force acting directly toward the center of curvature of the road. So maybe there's no centripetal force? But consider vector n. Aha! Vector n has a vector component along the horizontal and toward the center of curvature. It is this component of n that we call n sub x that produces the centripetal force to keep the car on its curved path. When n sub x satisfies the equation mv squared over r, no friction force is needed, none. The car would make the turn even if the road surface were slippery ice. And what's n sub y? Since there's no vertical acceleration, the magnitude of n sub y equals mg. Yum! Want to reduce tire wear when driving? Then drive on curved roads that are banked. Often you'll notice proper speeds posted for banked roadways. These speeds are calculated by engineers who work the angle of bank into the centripetal force equation. In the calculations, mass m cancels. So when you drive at the posted speed, whatever the mass of your car, you'll sail around the curve as if friction didn't exist. Next time you're riding on a banked road, think physics. Let's return to where we began, to Nellie. We said the tension T in her string was approximately equal to the centripetal force needed to keep the can moving in a circle. Why approximately? Because the string really isn't horizontal. Even for higher speeds, she can impart to the can. Note that vector t points a bit above the horizontal. So the needed centripetal force is the horizontal component of t that we call t sub x, which does lie along the radial direction. We can go further. How about the vertical direction? Since there's no vertical changes in motion, there has to be an equal and opposite force to counteract downward mg. That comes from the vertical component of t, t sub y. Is this yum or what? So the two vector components of t are quite intriguing. As said, the horizontal component supplies the needed centripetal force and the vertical component equals the magnitude of mg. 
This is particularly important when the tension vector is even farther from the horizontal, like in this conical pendulum. And that's yum too. I want to leave you with a question. If Nellie shortened her string to half its length, but kept the same speed V for the whirling can, how would the tension in the string be affected? Until next time, good energy. We return to Nellie whirling a can in a horizontal circle overhead. She's pulling inward and a little bit upward on the string. The upward part is to balance the downward force of gravity on the can. Very small. The inward part is centripetal force, a pull toward the center. Clearly there's no outward pull on the can. Let's look inside the can and assume motion is perfectly horizontal. A pet bug inside the can is also whirled in a circular path. There's clearly a centripetal force on her. This centripetal force, the bottom of the can pressing on her feet, provides a normal force on her. To her, it is a real force, as real as the force due to gravity. I'm neglecting the small downward force of gravity on her and considering only horizontal forces here. From a stationary frame of reference, we watch the whirling can very closely and see no outward force on the can and no outward force on the bug. Any forces on the can and the bug are inward-directed forces, what we learned previously. But what if we view all this from the bug's frame of reference inside the whirling can? The physics is quite different in a rotating frame of reference. From the bug's point of view, there's an outward force pressing her against the bottom of the can, as real to her as gravity. She calls this outward force a centrifugal force. It obeys the same equation as centripetal force. Its magnitude in newtons is the same as the magnitude of the centripetal force. Whereas centripetal force is center-seeking, centrifugal force is center-fleeing, or away from the center. If you were to find yourself in a rotating frame of reference, like the bug, centrifugal force would be as real to you as the force of gravity. However, there's a fundamental difference. Gravitational force is an interaction between one mass and another. The gravity we experience is part of our interaction with Earth. As such, it obeys Newton's third law. We pull on Earth, Earth pulls on us. We have discussed this before, ye yum stuff. But with centrifugal force in a rotating frame of reference, Newton's third law doesn't hold. The bug feels itself being pulled outward, but there's nothing doing the pulling. Bug is pulled outward by what? What does bug pull back on? Nothing. There is no something causing the pulling. No pulling counterpart exists. To better understand this important point, let's return to examples of previous lessons. When you push on a wall, the wall pushes back on you. This pair of equal and opposite forces illustrates Newton's third law. Remember that you can't push on the wall unless the wall pushes back equally hard on you. When the fist of a boxer hits the bag, the bag hits back on the fist. Again, a reaction force, an impressive one. And when the boxer hits the tissue paper, a tiny force. And if no tissue paper to interact with, then no force. The point is that a force can only exist when there's an action-reaction counterpart. No counterpart, no force. The centrifugal force in the bug has no counterpart. Nothing's pulling back. Therefore, physicists call centrifugal force an apparent force, a fictitious force not a real force like gravity, electric forces, or nuclear forces. Yet, to the bug in the whirling can, it is real enough. Consider a colony of bugs living inside a bicycle tire, a balloon tire with plenty of space inside. 
If we drop the tire from an airplane high in the sky, the bugs will be in a weightless condition. We show two of these bugs here. Now spin the tire and the bugs will feel themselves pressed to the outer part of the tire's interior. They won't feel like they're falling anymore. They will feel simulated gravity. To the bugs, the direction down would be radially outward. Think about that. Here we see part of a giant balloon tire in space. It's a rotating habitat, something you'll likely see in coming years. Inside is Phil Physiker. The floor presses against Phil's feet, the purple action force vector. Phil's feet press against the floor, the purple reaction vector. This pair of forces is real to us and to Phil. But from Phil's point of view inside the rotating system, there's another force. That's right. He experiences a centrifugal force, as challenging to him doing push-ups as gravity back on Earth. I hope you saw the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, that was popular many years ago. A rotating space habitat was featured, and occupants behaved as if they were under the influence of Earth gravity. That's because the spin rate was just right to provide a centrifugal force equal to mg for each occupant. Simulated gravity. Amazing. I want to leave you with a question. First, we live at a time before the advent of rotating habitats in space. Inhabitants of today's satellites are in a continual state of weightlessness, which eventually creates problems for the human body. Suppose a satellite is attached by a strong cable to a massive boulder, perhaps an asteroid. With both satellite and boulder revolving about the center of mass of the satellite boulder system. My question. How much centripetal or centrifugal acceleration should the satellite have to provide occupants with Earth normal weight? Defend your answer. Until next time, good energy. This is an actual sketch made by Isaac Newton. It shows the paths of a cannonball fired at different speeds from the top of a hypothetical mountain. Newton asserted that if fired fast enough, so the curved path of the cannonball matched the curvature of Earth, it would fall indefinitely. Here's a similar sketch. Let's call this Newton's Mountain, which we'll imagine is high enough to be above the effects of air drag. Let's put a cannon at the top of the mountain. If there were no gravity, then a horizontally fired cannonball would follow a straight line path. But there is gravity, so a fired cannonball would fall beneath this straight line path. Let's fire one. A little higher speed. Higher speed. Let's fire at really high speed. My goodness, look at this. The cannonball would... <laughs> Got to get the cannon out of the way. But the path matches Earth's curvature and the cannonball falls all around the Earth without ever touching the ground. It's an Earth satellite. Newton made calculations of what this speed would be and realized that cannonballs could never be fired that fast. Rocketry wasn't the order of the day back then, and certainly he wasn't hip to multi-stage rockets. So Newton did not envision humans ever putting satellites in orbit. What was the enormous speed that Newton calculated? I think you can calculate that speed also in your head without a calculator if you let me guide your thinking a bit. There are two things you need to know. Number one, that an object falling beneath a straight line path falls a vertical distance of five meters in its first second of fall. That's the distance an apple would fall in one second if you dropped it from the roof of your house. The second thing you need to know is how round Earth is. 
A geometrical fact about the curvature of Earth is that its surface drops a vertical distance of 5 meters for every 8,000 meters tangent to its surface. 8,000 meters is 8 kilometers. Consider a portion of Earth in a desert region where the land is flat and without obstructions. Let's mount a laser on a tripod about a meter above ground level and shine a laser beam horizontally out across the desert floor. Due to Earth's curvature, the beam downrange would be higher above the ground than at its starting point. At 8 kilometers downrange, the beam would be 5 meters above its starting level. This may prove interesting. Now suppose we replace the laser with a super cannon, one that can fire cannonballs with incredibly high speeds. Furthermore, we pretend there is no air resistance. What we want to do is calculate what Newton calculated, but in a different way. To begin, suppose we fire the cannonball at a speed of 2 kilometers per second. Then at the end of one second, with no Earth gravity, the cannonball will have reached 2,000 meters downrange. That's 2 kilometers. But there is gravity and it falls below this point. How far? That's right, 5 meters. But it would hit the ground before this happened. If the cannonball were to be airborne during this time, would have to dig a trench in the sand. Clearly, 2 kilometers per second is not fast enough for orbit. Let's fire the cannonball at twice the speed, at 4 kilometers per second. This time, the cannonball travels 4 kilometers during this second. But again, it would hit the ground before one second elapses, unless we dig another trench. I hope you can see where this is going. Let's try 6 kilometers per second. Is this fast enough so that we don't have to dig another trench? No, again, we'd have to dig sand out of the way, but notice, not as deep. Is there a speed wherein we don't have to dig a trench at all? And what is the speed? Can you see that if it gets 8 kilometers downrange in one second, and falls five meters below where it would go with no gravity, that no trench would be necessary? What's the speed? I hope you said eight kilometers per second. At eight kilometers per second, it never touches the ground. Note something interesting. Since there's no air drag to slow it down, when the cannonball gets to the eight kilometer distance, it's moving just as fast as initially. So it would repeat falling beneath a new tangent every second. Unless some force interrupts it, it would fall indefinitely. It would be an Earth satellite. Yum. Now, 8 kilometers per second doesn't sound fast, but convert it to miles per hour and you get 18,000 miles per hour. At higher elevations, orbital speed is less. For example, the International Space Station orbits at an average speed of 7.7 .7 kilometers per second, a bit less than 8 kilometers per second. Is the space station above Earth's gravity? No. What it is above is Earth's atmosphere, most of it anyway. Because of slight air drag, every once in a while, the space station has to be given a boost in speed. Astronauts inside are in a continual state of free fall, which feels like there's no gravity. But Earth gravity at that altitude is nearly 90% of what it is here at Earth's surface. Without it, the space station and all Earth satellites would fly off into straight line paths. Let me leave you with a question. Why does a satellite in circular orbit maintain a constant speed? And tie this to your answer as to why a bowling ball rolling along an alley also has a constant speed. Both the satellite and the bowling ball are pulled downward by gravity. So why don't they speed up? Until next time, good energy.